We continue in Tarain Inshallah Azza wa Jal. We speak about Ibad al Rahman, the slaves of Al Rahman, the ones who Allah Azza wa Jal uh, guaranteed the high levels of paradise for. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Wa Ibad al Rahman al Ladin Yamshun al Ardi Huna, wa Ida Khatabu Hun Jahiluna Kalu Salam. And the slaves of Al Rahman are those who walk on earth with humility. <coughs> Walking on earth with humility is a reality, not that which is only apparent. Some people think that for you to walk with humility, you walk with your shoulders bent, you walk weak, you walk like an individual who uh, can be easily oppressed or put on. This is not the way of the believers. Aisha radiallahu anha, when she's seen men walking like this, and they were described as, they are trying to be like those who walk on the earth with humility. She says, Umar anhu, he was a man and he was humble. Either uh, either He she said anha, about Umar anhu, who was a man who had humility. That if he was to walk, he would walk fast. He wouldn't walk slow, shoulders bent, he would walk fast at a fast pace. And this was also the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And if he spoke, he could be heard. He didn't like whisper and try and be any very humble by whispering and not talking loud so that no one thinks that he's obnoxious. It wasn't fake. And if he was to hit, he would hurt. And he was strong. So when it says that the slaves of Ar-Rahman are those who walk on earth with humility, it's talking about the reality of humility, not which the people take as the apparent of the humility. A person who can easily be put on. This is not what is humble. A person being humble is opposite than pride. What is pride? The Prophet ﷺ described pride to us. Ghamtun nas wa batrul haq. Ghamtun nas, for you to think that you're better than others. This is pride. For you to think that you're better than others. With what right do you believe that you're better than others? Because you have more money than them? Because you're from a particular race? Because you're from a particular family? Because uh, you have a particular passport? You know, because you know certain things that they don't? What makes you better than others? The only thing that differentiates us in the eyes of Allah is our religion. Who <laughs> the most honored from amongst you with Allah are those with, the, with most righteousness. So a person knowing that it is not my wealth that makes me better than someone else, it's not my race, it's not my last name, it's not my history, it's how religious I am. That's what differentiates me between someone and someone else. And he doesn't know his level of religiosity. How do I know whether I'm more religious than someone else? How do I know whether I have more taqwa than someone else? So this matter of thinking that you're better than someone else, this is removed from the mind of a believer. This is one way that he's humble. The second, that he rejects the truth. The second trait of pride that the Prophet ﷺ told us is that the person rejects the truth. Sometimes the truth is given to them and it's clear to see. It's clear as day. But they reject that. Why? Because of their pride. Their pride makes them reject it. This is not the way of my father. I don't agree with it. It doesn't suit my whims and desires. Whatever the excuse may be. The person with pride, he thinks that he's better than others and he rejects the truth. So when you walk on the earth with humility, things like you've got good character. Things like you don't oppress anyone, even though you have the ability to. For example, you're stronger than others, but you don't oppress them. You don't take away any of their rights. Things like you respect those that are older than you. Things like showing mercy to those that are below you. Things like forcing yourself to change in order to come with the, what the Sharia came with. Things like putting yourself in positions that maybe someone else wouldn't have, but you do it for the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal. Maybe, for example, you clean the toilets. Or, for example, when you run to serve your parents, you massage your parents' feet. You don't have pride in, in that regard. You come and you learn the religion, even if you have to be with kids. You don't have pride. You do what it takes, even though someone else will say, no way, I'll be in that position. But you have no issue doing it. Now, and for some people, they may be hoping the, those that are in, in need, sacrificing for their time, something that someone else doesn't want to do. 
Maybe that you earn a halal living, even if you have to work a job that people don't consider as being as honorable. Whatever it may be, you show traits of humility. Humility never means that you're not a man. In Islam, we're taught to be strong in all sense of the word. But our strength never leads to us having pride, which as you described, number one, thinking that you're better than others, or number two, a person uh, rejecting the truth. And if the ignorant speak to them, they reply back with words of peace. <coughs> now, if an ignorant person wants to argue with you, wants to talk to you, wants to debate you, he says a stupid comment, how do you respond to it? You can respond with, the, with stupidity to the one that is stupid to you, but that's not going to get you anywhere praiseworthy. If you're dealing with a kid, and he calls you stupid, and you say, like, you're stupid. What are you going to benefit from? Arguing with the kid. Unfortunately, sometimes we look at adults and think they cannot have the minds of children. Some adults have the maturity of children, unfortunately. And so sometimes an adult, someone that you think is meant to know better, someone that you think is meant to have knowledge and intellect and wisdom, sometimes the way that they interact with you, it's not any appropriate. They say something stupid, they you know, speak out of line, they're extremely disrespectful. Make sure that when you respond, it's going to be worth your response. If you respond to a person who, you know, all of this bad is shown from them in the same way, then there's no winner at the end. You have to be better than them. And that requires patience and it requires humility. You need to have patience in order for you to say, whatever man, let this guy go. Otherwise, you respond in a bad way. Someone swears at you, yani your mom, you swear at his mom, for example. It's not the way of a believer. What did his mom do wrong to you? Jayid? And you have to be humble. Because if your ego gets in the way, he said that to me, there's no way I'm going to let it go. And we have famous lines like, it's not about what he done, it's about the principle. Or it's not about the money, it's about the principle. These are all lines that we've used to justify our wrong. If Islamically it's correct, Yes, okay, no problem. But when someone is dumb to you, and you say, I had to slap him. Why did you have to slap him? Because I need to teach him a lesson. You say, okay, now he's, gonna get, he's not going to learn his lesson. He's going to do it to the next person. And he's going to continue doing it. And he's going to make you look like the bad guy. Yeah, but Sheikh was about the principle. Halas, someone is stupid, someone's an idiot. Move on. If there's goodness in replying back to them, if there's goodness in replying back openly, even if there's goodness in hitting that person, you need to actually stop them, then possibly. But whatever the action that you take, it has to be that which is going to lead to a better outcome. But to do something where you stoop to a load of a person where there's going to be no praise where the outcome at the end of it then, this is not from the traits of the slaves of Ar-Rahman. And those who stay up at night for the sake of their Lord in prostration and standing yani in prayer. From the you know, trait of Ibad al-Rahman, the ones who are promised and guaranteed the higher levels in paradise, is that they pray the night prayers. They pray the night prayers. And the night prayers are the best of prayers after the Fard prayers. And the night prayers start from after the Sunnah of Aisha. So you pray Aisha and you pray Sunnah and after that is night prayers. And the best of the night prayers is you know, the Tahajjud time, the last third of the night. So if a person was able to delay their prayers to the last third of the night, then this is best. But if a person can't for whatever reason, then after you pray your Isha and you pray your Sunnah, then pray even if it's two rak'at. Even if it's two rak'at of Qiyam al-Layl, make sure that you pray them and get yourself used to it. And now Alhamdulillah in the later to Ramadan, we should all be trying to pray that little bit extra. And we will have the opportunity inside the month of Ramadan, inshallah Azza wa Jal, when we're praying Taraweeh, and then we come and also for those that join, pray in you know, the Tahajjud prayer. This is, these are all ways for you to build yourself up, for you to be able to pray the night prayers. And inshallah, Azza wa Jalla, come from Ibad rahman and have these traits. And don't just limit yourself to saying, Ramadan, I'm going to pray the night prayers. Even when you're praying in, you know, in Taraweeh and Tahajjud, make sure your intention is that you want to continue after, inshallah. We prove ourselves, we prove to ourselves every single year that we can live a normal life. 
and we don't eat and drink and we can do the ibadah at night. <coughs> Even though we're working and we have families and we have commitments, etc. Why? Because we get ourselves into that mindset. Keep yourself in that mindset even after the month of Ramadan. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّ نَسْرِفْ عَنَّا الْعَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ إِنَّ عَذَابَ كَانَ غَرَامًا And they say, they make dua to Allah Azza wa Jalla that they are protected from the hellfire. Verily, it's uh, punishment is yani, something severe. When it comes to the hellfire, the believer doesn't interact with the hellfire <laughs> as if it's something abstract and far away. Rather, the believer, every single moment in his life, he has between his eyes the paradise and the hellfire. And his actions are dictated by where he wants to go. This is the mindset of the believer. You have those that live their life the whole day and they do not think about the hellfire or the paradise once. This is not the mindset of the believer. The mindset of the believer is that in between his eyes, in every action that he does, there is the paradise and there is the hellfire. And every action is dictated by him asking himself, which of the two do I want to go to? Every single action. My words that I'm saying now, are they taking me to the paradise or the hellfire? My, yani, what I'm eating, where I'm in, the people that I'm mingling with, are, is this a place, is this a gathering? Are these people that are taking me to the paradise or to the hellfire? Where I spend my money, where I enjoy myself, where I holiday, how my wife is, how my kids are, are these things taking me to the paradise or to the hellfire? These things need to dictate your every action. And when we speak about the paradise and we speak about the hellfire, the whole journey to the hereafter, the point is not for information, but the point is for us to fix our actions. When we have the statement of Umar al-Anu, which you've all memorized, Hold yourself to account before you hold to account. What does that mean to hold yourself to account? I mean to ask yourself the actions that you are upon now. If you were to die right this second, are you going to the paradise or are you going to the hellfire? We know Ramadan, la'allakum tattakun. So that you may attain taqwa. One of the practical definitions of taqwa, at taqwa here, al khawfu min al jaleel wal amal bil tanzil wal qana'atu bil qaleel wal isti'adatu li yawm al rahim. For taqwa is to truly fear Allah, to implement the revelation, to be content with little. And the final one is for you to be prepared for the day that you will leave this dunya. How do you be prepared? How do you know if you're prepared? Simple question. Ask yourself, do you truly believe that if you were to pass away right now, your actions dictate that you get to the paradise or the hellfire? If you were to die right now, where do you believe that you're going? The responsibilities that you have, have you fulfilled them or neglected them? The obligations that you have, have you fulfilled them or neglected them? The major sins, have you stayed away from them or are you committing them? The minor sins, are you trying your best to stay away from them or are you committing them? The bad that you've done in the past, have you repented from it or you don't care about it? If you've oppressed anyone, have you returned their rights back or do you continue to oppress them? Your, you know, that, that which you're leaving behind, are you leaving behind? Actions which are going to continue to get you reward, or are you leaving behind actions which are going to leave behind sins that are ongoing? If you were to die right this second, where do you believe that you are going? If a person believes that he's going to the paradise, alhamdulillah, thank Allah Azza wa Jal, and make sure you continue to do good with sincerity. But if a person tells himself, I honestly believe that if I also die right now, I'm going to the hellfire, then this is not a good place to be in. And upon you knowing that fact is to ask Allah Azza wa for forgiveness. And to ask Allah Azza wa to save you from the punishment of the hellfire. The punishment of the hellfire is a humiliation. The punishment of the hellfire is severe and it's tormenting. The punishment of the hellfire is not a place that any human being wants to go. Nor is a place that any human being can handle. So our job, our duty is to do everything that we can to stay away from the hellfire. And part of that is asking Allah Azza wa to keep you away from it. In the Hasad Mustaqarra wa Muqama, verily it is an extremely bad place for a person to be. Who are we seeking refuge from the hellfire here? Who are we talking about? The bad people or the good people? Here. The good people. The good people. The good people. Never ever fool yourself into thinking that you being religious means that you're safe from the hellfire. Anyone who thinks that, shaitan's fooled him. 
Anyone who thinks, Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Anyone thinks, oh, 100%, I'm fine. Alhamdulillah, I know if I was to die right now, I truly believe I'm going to go to the paradise. We say, your hope is that you're going to paradise. When you believe that paradise is guaranteed, know that you've been fooled by the shaitan. The shaitan has many different ways for him to misguide people. Many different ways. He will try and get you to commit what? Well, first and foremost, the highest number one on the list of shaitan. Sure. But will he try, he'll try and get you to commit kufr and shirk. Disbelief in Allah Azza wa Jal. To associate partners with Allah Azza wa Jal. If he can't get you to that extent, what will you do? Go to? <coughs> major sins. Major sins. He can't get you to major sins, he will try and go to a lot of minor sins. Also from the, what he does is, if he, if he can't get a person to commit haram, direct haram, he can't get you to gamble, he can't get you to you know, take drugs, he can't get you to fornicate, he can't get you to drink alcohol, he can't get you to be bad to your parents, but surely you do a lot of good. Where will he start to attack you from? Yes, your good deeds. Your good deeds. Examples? Don't press him. Don't press him. He will try and remove you away from your good deeds. He will try and reduce the good deeds. This is another way of saying that. But through your good deeds itself. He will tell you that you're safe now. Allahu Akbar, man. You're amazing. Look look at your prayers. You pray in the masjid, mashallah. You pray your five daily prayers, tabarakallah. Wallah, you're amazing, man. You're a top Muslim, tabarakallah. And when you start to feel that you're comfortable, what ends up happening? Adrian, you're a boxer. What happens when a fighter starts to become complacent? You he thinks, oh, man, I've got this guy easy. Right. He becomes complacent. Well, Next thing down. you know, he wake up, e, what happened? <laughs> and everyone's around him, he's catching saying, it's all right, it's all right. What did I get caught with? I'm not living off there. Huh? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> not being complacent. Jayid, can't be complacent. As soon as you become complacent, shaitan gets you. You've opened up the doors. And this is what happens with the shaitan. He comes to you. If you can't get you to commit haram, through your religion itself, he makes you complacent. Think, oh, alhamdulillah, I'm good. I'm, I'm guaranteed paradise almost. And because of that, you start to drop. We always give this example. The ten who are guaranteed paradise. When the Prophet said, Abu Bakr is in paradise, and Umar is in paradise, and Uthman is in paradise, and Ali is in paradise, and the, you know, the other companions, even other than ten, there's others that were guaranteed paradise. Did these people become complacent in their religion, or they started to work harder? They started to work harder. So this is one way that you know that you've been fooled by the shaitan. Because you start to think that, oh, I can relax now, because I've done enough. Now, or another way that Iblis gets a person into you know, being fooled through his good deeds, is for him to think that he's better than others. It's for him to think that he's better than others. So look at me, alhamdulillah, I pray my sunnah prayers. Look at that guy over there. Doesn't even pray sunnah prayers. Are you even Muslim, bro? <laughs> look at that guy, doesn't know how to read. Ali Bata, alhamdulillah. I know how to read, I know how to read with tajweed. Look at this guy. What a dad. He starts to fall into pride, okay, which is a sin. And he thinks he's better than others. Okay, so, yani, if this person wants to die, 100% Jahannam. If I was to die, Allah will bury. Higher levels of paradise. This is a problem, it's a sickness. And because yani, people, they, they've gotten so used to bad equaling sin only. And what is that sin that they think of? They think of the sins themselves. Like yani, swearing, smoking, backbiting, etc. But they forget that sin can also be through your good deeds. Or the attack of shaitan can also come through your good deeds. And that's something that a person always needs to be careful of. And so the, the righteous, they're asking Allah Azza wa Jal to save them from the hellfire. Because they know that there's a chance that they could end up there. What if their actions weren't accepted? What if they weren't sincere? What if they drop off later on? So the believer is always in between the hope and fear. He does it hoping in that good from Allah Azza wa Jal. But he's never fooled into thinking that he's safe. You're never safe until you know, your soul has been taken by the angel of death and given to you know, the angels of mercy. And a person that when they spend, they are moderate. They do not spend uh, excessively, nor are they stingy. This is again from the traits of the believers, that they're moderate. They're not people that have to be completely away from the dunya and, and, and in a, in a uh, blameworthy manner. They're stingy. 
They don't wear nice clothes. They don't eat good food. They don't spend on their families. They don't yani, enjoy anything from the dunya. But at the same time, they're not overly excessive. They're not overly excessive. And this is something that, again, we need to be very careful with. Because not everything that is halal is appropriate. And a lot of people have this misunderstood. Not everything that is halal is appropriate. Some people think, Sheikh, is a haram if I buy this? Is a haram if I buy this? Is a haram if I buy this? When your mindset is, is a haram if I do this? Then you've lost track of what you're trying to achieve with Allah Azza wa Jal. You've got the yani, entry level, basic Muslim. And then you've got the higher levels. We need to be working as Muslims for those higher levels. When we speak about the paradise and the traits that Allah gives us of the people of paradise, you're looking at those higher levels, not the basic entry level. Allah Azza wa Jal told us yani, already about a person entering Islam. Okay, do they have the high praise? They don't have the high praise. Uh, what, what and when some of the Bedouins became Muslim, they said, Amanna. Oh, we have high Iman. And Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Don't say you have the high Iman. Say you, you've become Muslim. You're basic level. No problem. But were they praised? They weren't praised. Were they guaranteed paradise? They weren't guaranteed paradise. You are basic Muslim, alhamdulillah. You're fulfilling your duty. But don't put yourself up there. A person who you know, wants to have that status with Allah Azza wa Jalla, that he is higher up, a person who wants his higher levels in paradise, then you need to work up at the end, inshallah. A person needs to work harder. A person needs to put in more effort. Again, if we give you know, the training example, if you go to like boxer size, yeah, okay, you know how to work out for half an hour. Doesn't mean you're going to become Allah Mabarik, uh, the WBC holder. You're not, going to, you're not going to be even contender. You're not going to be in the top 100. You're not going to be in the top 1,000. Okay, yeah, you know how to work out for half an hour. But you, you don't know how to box. And if you did know how to, if you have a boxing lesson or two, doesn't mean that you know how to get to those high levels. You're entry level, Habibi. You're basic. Know your level. Similarly, when it comes to our Iman and our Islam, if we always look at, okay, the basics. Okay, the basics is good. No problem. Inshallah, you still enter paradise. You do the basics, you're going to enter paradise, inshallah. But don't put yourself on those high levels. Don't fool yourself. So when it comes to spending and enjoying this dunya, some people again have the wrong understanding. When they think, oh, it's halal, I'll do it. Not everything that is halal is appropriate. If I was to spit in my hand right now and wipe it on my thaw, halal or haram? Halal. halal. Is it appropriate? It's not appropriate. <coughs> it's not appropriate. Not everything that is halal is appropriate. Jayid, if I was to give this lesson in a singlet, halal or haram? Halal. Appropriate? Oh, you guys are trying to picture him. <laughs> <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not appropriate. So not everything that is halal is appropriate for a person to do. The same thing when it comes to spending. When Allah Azza wa praises those that spend, what does He praise? He praises those that spend moderately. Don't be excessive, nor be stingy. Don't be excessive, nor be stingy. Some people, if they have $100,000, then yes, it's halal for you to yani, enjoy yourself with that $100,000. But is that the best way to spend your money? It's not the best way to spend your money. What about the charity? What about the poor and needy? What about the masajid? What about da'wah? What about those that yani, don't have anything to enjoy? What about your family members? Looking after your family members? What about all of these people? Yes, it's halal for you to enjoy your all on yourself. But what about that which is better than spending on you and yourself? Remember Islam, we're looking at that which is better. That which is better. Don't be a person who's completely stingy. You know, don't say, mashallah, you're a millionaire and you, know, you wear you know, second-hand clothes. This is not what Islam wants. Allah Azza wa Jal, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, loves to see the uh, effect of the blessing on his slave. And Allah's given you money, alhamdulillah, and look the part. Don't be excessive. Don't tell me you needed to buy a any seven thousand dollar shirt because you're a millionaire, or a three thousand dollar shirt, or two thousand dollar slippers. That's excessive. But to wear something that looks good, something that is presentable, any something where any alhamdulillah, people can say that Allah's best you what you have. Alhamdulillah, good. This is good. I remember any some relatives. And mashallah, you know, they were millionaires. 
and the you know, what the children would wear, it it wasn't nice. And this you know, especially in the area that they were living in and the people that they were around, this is embarrassing. That there's there was a certain standard and they were well below that standard. Well below. It's not what Islam wants either. Because now you're causing any harm to your family by you being stingy and not spending on your family in order for them to be at least the average of what people are. Now people look at them and they laugh at them. They get mocked. It's not what Islam wants. Islam wants the average. Stick to the average. Don't get excessive and don't be stingy in your spending. Always look to that which is better. Always look to that which is better and not just, well, it's halal, so I'll, I don't. والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون نفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون وما يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما. And those who do not accept, those do not call, call upon anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The matter of shirk is not a matter to be belittled. And unfortunately, يعني year after year, Muslims are belittling the matter of shirk more and more. Shirk is to associate upon us with Allah عز وجل. Shirk is to associate partners with Allah Azza wa Jal or give something that belongs to Allah to other than Allah. This is a massive issue. We as Muslims are the only real monothe monotheistic faith left. The only ones who truly worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone. We are the only true faith that has this. But what we are doing is we are monitoring down, watering down our monotheism with things like the acceptance of things that go clearly against the religion. For example, now what's coming up uh, in a few weeks' time, Easter, for example. Easter's coming up. We get asked every single year. To me, it is one of the most immature questions a person can ask. Sheikh, can we buy Easter eggs? Sheikh, can we buy the Easter money? Tayyip. No, that, not after, that's the second question. We're going to get to that. <laughs> Would you ask the Prophet ﷺ, can we buy Easter eggs? You would never ask that question. Why? Because you know the answer already. You already know the answer. This is something that is celebrating that which Allah Azza wa hates, which is shirk. Allah Azza wa hates shirk. Allah, you know, the worst thing a person can commit is shirk. That's the worst thing a person can commit. Any other sin, Allah can forgive. إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَغْفِرُ الظُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Verily Allah Azza wa Jal forgives all sins إِلَّا يُشْرَكَ بِهِ Except that partners are associated with him. Nothing ever, ever, ever is worse than shirk. Nothing ever. Get now a pig, slaughter it in the masjid, cook it and eat it, and it's nothing compared to shirk. Commit zina with a billion women, and it's nothing compared to shirk. Flood the world with drugs, it's nothing compared to shirk. Go and punch your parents in the face, nothing compared to shirk. I don't know if these things are happening. None of them are halal. But to show you how many people, they look at certain sins that they don't look at shirk as. Yani, if something's got bacon in it or pork, they'll never go near it. They'll never go near it. Get a piece of pork or bacon and put it in front of yani, a Muslim family, they'll be uproar. A'udhu what are you doing? But get things that celebrate the matters of shirk, like Easter eggs. MashaAllah, JazakAllah khair, Allah, These are my favorite ones. What's worse? What's worse? In, it, it's off for the celebration of shirk. Or, for example, Christmas. Yani, someone putting a Christmas tree in their house, or when they get to the shopping center and there's a guy taking photos with the kids and you put the kid on the Santa's lap and he makes a wish, that's an issue. That's a massive issue. What are you instilling in your children? That Santa's, uh, that Santa's a good man, Santa's nice, we're, this is Christmas celebration. Oh, Merry Christmas, oh, Merry Christmas. Sheikh, we're just being nice. Oh, Merry Christmas, what are you saying? Do you know what you're saying? Do you know what you're congratulating them on? That Allah Azza wa Jal had a son on this day. Congratulations for believing that Allah had a son on this day. Oh, Shaykh, we're just being nice. Now, you're being nice, how? By disrespecting Allah Azza wa Jal? Does that make sense to you? <coughs> In order to be nice to someone, you disrespect Allah Azza wa Jal? This is from the lack of Iman. 
and understanding that people have regarding their faith. It's a big issue. Then there are many things, because we haven't learned our religion properly, because of our ignorance, there are many things that go against Tawheed and are actually shirk without people knowing. Things like, uh, see a shooting star, what do you do? Make a wish. Make a wish. Yeah. No. You see a shooting star, make a wish. People think it's innocent. They don't even know what they're doing. Ammi Allah Yadik, this is shirk. You think that now if you make a wish, see a shooting star is going to come true? This is again giving something that only Allah Azza has the capability of making your reality come true or accepting your dua at a particular time. Or what's those little, the the white, little, little white things that come, what are they called? Oh, the little yeah. fluffy things? You know the little, oh, yeah. little flower cookie. things. Not fortune cookie. It's it like fortune cookie. Oh. The little. Oh. And then you blow. Yeah. 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 You make a wish and, and you blow. The little, you little dandelions. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The people think, oh, it's innocent. Yeah. I wish for Bilal to stop talking in class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is this is a matter of shirk. Or even believe people believing in things of suspicion. You that walk under a ladder. Or if you see a black cat, you got a problem. Or if a uh, bird. Uh, Yani does something on you, it's good luck. Okay? All of these things, these are things of shirk. These are things of shirk. And it's one thing that's affecting a lot of the women now. Uh, star signs again. Are oh, you a Virgo? Oh, sorry, I'm a Leo. We're not compatible. Or oh, you're a Scorpio? I'm a Gemini. We get together. Or whatever it is. I don't know if that's how it looks. But yani, this is yani, what they're believing in. It's becoming widespread again. You have, you're thinking that the time that you were born has some effect on you as a person. These things are issues. These things are from the merit of shirk. But again, because of such a lack of knowledge in the ABCs of our religion, we're falling into these matters. The number one thing that the prophets come and call to is Worship Allah and stay away from anything which is worshipped besides Allah. People say, yeah, but Shaykh, we're not worshipping a wrong Understand what it means for something to be an act of worship that you believe in it You believing in it that it has some effect on you. This is part of your faith <laughs> This is something believing that only Allah can affect You saying that this can also affect did Allah give it any right? No So that means you are believing in something which goes against the teachings of Islam This is part, comes a part of shirk Like we said another example common example the blue eye, but the blue eye has been there for a long time ago and the people believing that this protects from the evil eye, etc. All of these are massive issues that we've spoken about a long time ago. Now, but things that are, people are belittling, like the you know, Christmas, like Easter, like even uh, blowing you know, for a birthday party. Now they have their birthday cake and they have the candles and make a wish and blow out the candles. All of these are things of shirk. All of these are things of shirk which people are belittling. The people need to really get back to the ABCs of their Tawheed, ABCs of their belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, and ensure that they understood their Islam correctly, so that they don't fall into the shirk knowingly or unknowingly. Knowingly or unknowingly. And Alhamdulillah, there's no excuse for you not to learn today. And it is masjid all around, there's mashaykh all around, there's lessons all around. And if you can't do that, Alhamdulillah, there's books yani, by the millions. And if you can't read, Alhamdulillah, there's many, many lessons. Go to YouTube and there's a billion lessons on the ABCs of your religion and your Aqidah. This is not something that should be belittled. And if a person falls into the consequence, falls into the action of these problems, then it is their consequence that they have to deal with. Because you had the ability to learn and you didn't go after it. <clears throat> and they do not kill the soul that, are, that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, prohibited except with right. A person is not allowed to kill something or someone except with the right of Allah Azza wa Jal, meaning the religion of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. You cannot kill someone without right, for example, yani a very common way is abortion. Abortion after the, the soul has been breathed in to the body, which is after 120 days, yani four months approximately. This now, if you kill it, it's like yani a person killing a life. Before that, it's still not allowed. Before that, it's still not allowed, but it's less of a prohibition then after the soul has been breathed into the body. Now, now what's happening with a lot of people, unfortunately, alhamdulillah, Wollongong 
it's not as bad of a problem. But you know, people in Sydney, uh, where it's becoming very easy for people to kill one another, this is a massive issue. And doing it without haq, doing it without right. And some people are justifying for themselves what is right and what is not right. There are rules. When it comes to the Sharia, like an eye for an eye, there are rules when it comes to uh, killing someone. If someone killed someone, in order for you to get your hat back, get your right, there are rules. It is not Wallah, because he killed someone, we're allowed to kill him. That is not how it works. Number one, the rulings are carried out by the Amir, carried out by the ruler of a place. If there's no ruler to ensure that there is an anarchy, then it's not, it's not implemented. You know, if someone kills someone, and then that person kills someone back, what's going to happen? It's just going to keep on going. And this is a problem, and we see the effects of this. In the past few years, and it happened approximately a decade ago, and it's just going to continue. But when it's done through an Islamic court, that the killing originally was wrong, and now that person is to be killed. The <coughs> Islamic State does it. Islamic State meaning, <coughs> not ISIS. Islamic State meaning a country which is run by Islam. Okay. And then even when it's called Al-Ain uh, Al-Ain Now an eye for an eye, when you have the Asaba, the Asaba is the men from the father's side. So for example, the, uzn, the uncles, the cousins, etc. They have to all agree that they want retribution for the blood. So, person killed someone. The men from the father's side, they have to all agree that they want that person to be killed. If even one person says, I don't want him to be killed. If I want to accept the blood money or I want to forgive him, then he's not to be killed. Now, this is not a small matter. It's much bigger than, oh, he killed someone, we're going to kill him. Okay, it's much bigger than that. So people need to be and they're very careful and justifying for themselves that which is halal and haram when it comes to killing. But unfortunately, as we mentioned, this is becoming more and more belittled. And the easiest way for a person to build up their name in that world now is by them shooting someone. And people think, well, that's nothing. Wallah, I'll kill him. Wallah, I'll do this. Wallah, I'll do this. Yeah, and you're going to have to deal with the consequences on the day of judgment. The first thing to be asked about on the day of judgment is what? Prayer. Prayer. This is between you and Allah Azza wa Between you and the people, what's the first thing to be asked about? Blood. Okay? Blood. And you use killing someone, etc. Allah Azza wa told us, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ لَيَّذَا مِنْ قُتِلَتْ What's al-mawooda? The newborn baby. The newborn baby, girl, she will be asked, why were you killed? Does she have anyone that relies on her. Usually who was the one that killed the newborn girl? Yeah, the, the father. This was yani, uh, with some a normal practice. So it was the father that killed the newborn daughter. That newborn girl is going to be asked, why was she killed? Yani, people are going to be held responsible for killing such an innocent soul. Does she have anyone that relies on her? She doesn't have anyone. When you kill someone, let's say he's an adult, and he's done it without right, not only will they be asked why you know, did that person kill you and you're going to get your right off that person, but also there's further asking, which is what? The people that rely on that person, like the children of that person, you killed them without right. Now that child now is also going to take their right off you on the day of judgment because you took someone that they relied on without any right. And so it's not just well, a small issue. Some people, they think that... Uh, <laughs> and this has happened unfortunately more than once, like a lot. Some people think they'll kill someone and if it was by mistake or even if they they killed them on purpose but they want to fix it and they just give them blood money. Listen, khalas, I'll give you the blood money, I'll give you X amount of dollars, that's it, it's finished. No. What about the kids of that person, the child of that person? Not just Allah, the people that want to get retribution, you give them to shut them up. What about the wife of that person? What about the mother of that person? The father of that person? The brothers and sisters of that person? the business that he used to look after, the workers, that what happens to them. All of these people, you stuffed up their life. And these people will have right with you on the day of judgment that you have to give back. So killing someone is not something simple. It is not something simple at all. Nor is any harm of, an, of another person without right. Whether it's you oppressing them financially, physically, emotionally, all of these things you're going to be held accountable for on 
the day of judgment. And they do not fornicate. Fornication and adultery. Fornication, obviously, when a person is not married. Uh, adultery when a person is married. This thing is becoming extremely, extremely, extremely simple today. And it's easier than drinking water, unfortunately. Now, for some of you, it's still very hard. But, alhamdulillah, yani for that, any yani blessing in disguise. Uh, uh, but the general rule, unfortunately, is that it's becoming extremely easy for people to fornicate. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, when it comes to fornication, He says, <coughs> Do not go in knee zina. Don't go in knee zina. It's not a matter of not fornicating. It's a matter of don't go in knee zina. What does it mean to not go in knee zina? There was an article today of a uh, famous rugby league player, him and his moral girlfriend. Because they're both Christians, they're going to abstain from intimacy until they get married. You look at all of their photos, the way she dresses, the way he dresses, the, the yeah, they do everything together, but they don't fornicate. This is not what Allah wants from you. Allah wants you to block the door, all of the doors that lead to zina. Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. shaitan. Yani, it being haram, anything that leads to it, it's also haram. Looking at the haram is not allowed. Listening to the haram is not allowed. Speaking the haram is not allowed. Being in an environment of haram is not allowed. All of these things are not allowed. How, what some of the ways that zina became? So, and it's so widespread. But all the trash that people are watching. All the trash that people are watching. We mentioned last week, and subhanAllah, there was an article also written the next day about it. The next day of the day after, I can't remember. But it was written the next day about uh, how, much, uh, how much more now women are cheating than they were 20, 30 years ago. But again, they speak about it in a praiseworthy way. This is something shameful. This is something shameful. That a woman who her nature, her nature is that she's more modest. Her nature is that she's more shy. Her nature is that she only wants to be with one man. That is her nature. You are now, you've taken that nature away from her and made it the norm. Or made it acceptable. Made it something fun. Making something thrilling. That now she's out there. Ayyadu billah, yani committing adultery. How do you accept such an act? How do the people accept such an act? Because we've drowned ourselves in the filth. We've drowned ourselves in the filth without even realizing. A parable, akramakumullah, and may Allah honor you all. When a person is in the bathroom, and again, he's done yani, a very smelly one. Him being in the bathroom for 20 seconds, what ends up happening to that smell? Disappear. Completely normal. He doesn't even smell anything anymore. This is our reality. This is how we are, unfortunately. We live in the filth without, without, without us even realizing what we're doing. Without realizing what we're accepting. Think of every show that you've watched. From when you were a kid to now. Boyfriend, girlfriend, kissing, dating, sneaking out, going against what the father is saying. From when you were young to now. Look at what your wife is watching, what your sister is watching, what your daughter is watching, now even what your mother is watching. There's things that would never, ever, ever be acceptable in households before. Now everyone's watching as if it's normal. The shows that they're interested in, the shows, all of it is just in trash and rubbish. This island and that island and Jahannam Island and married that first sight and now they're swapping wives and partners on... It's all Jahannam ala Jahannam ala Jahannam. But when people watch it, what ends up happening without them realizing? They become desensitized to the notion. They become desensitized to the notion. Every couple, he cheated on her, she cheated on him. And then the justifications, they're going through a hard time. They're a little bit broken up. They you know, got into an affair at work. They wanted something, you know, uh, they wanted to thrill seek. All of these issues that people use to justify the fornicating or the uh, cheating on the, the spouse that they had and as if it's something praiseworthy now so you know, at least bare minimum it's not something bad that's bare minimum it's not something bad and we watch it and we watch it and we watch it and then people get surprised that there's that much cheating that happens <coughs> that much fornication that happens people get surprised what are you surprised at this is the reality that people are going to go through the applications that they make yani, wallah it's ridiculous you as a Muslim just know that you're told 
don't gain near zina. Meaning anything that pushes you even a millimeter closer to zina, stay away from it. Even a millimeter closer to zina, stay away from it. Pornography, movies, you need that you need increase your desires, etc. Anything, stay away from it. The trash that people are on 24-7 with social media, stay away from it. The shows that are trash that people watch, which is all about this stuff, stay away from it. The friends that do it, stay away from it. The environments that people go to that you know, cause a person to fall into it, stay away from it. That's how you protect yourself from zina. Otherwise, again, you have to deal with the consequences. Whoever does that, then they're going to have to deal with the consequences. The consequences of those sins, which I don't believe could very well be, the whole fire. You don't have to have the day of the day of the day of the day of the punishment will only be increased for them on the day of judgment and they will abide therein forever. Abide therein very often, the one who died upon shirk. The Muslims will always and, uh, eventually leave the hellfire. But here you notice, you don't have to have the the hellfire will be, the, the punishment will be increased because you get used to the punishment so it always has to increase. إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك يبدو الله سيئات محسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما except the one except the one who repents and believes and does righteous deeds for them Allah عز وجل he changes and swaps their sins for good deeds and verily Allah عز وجل is forgiving and merciful for you as an individual that wants that closest to Allah عز وجل it's not just about asking Allah for forgiveness. Ya Allah, forgive me. Yes, of course. You ask Allah Azza for forgiveness. But how? You have to be sincere in your asking Allah for forgiveness. And not only you have to be sincere, you have to be truthful in your, in your seeking forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal. How does that come? Through you working righteous deeds and staying steadfast upon it. وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا And you worked righteous deeds. It is not something theoretical or simple to say, Ya Allah, Samahni. But then you continue doing what you're doing. The conditions of repentance are very important and you need to memorize them. What are they? Number one. Stop. First, something before all of that. Sincerity. Sincerity. A person needs to be doing it for the sake of Allah. If you're repenting because you ran out of money, if you're repenting because your wife's going to leave you, if you're repenting because your children yani, hate you. If you're repenting because someone now after you. All of this is not sincere, sincere repentance. You need to want to repent from the bottom of your heart. You, when you ask Allah for forgiveness, you need to want that forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal. You need to want that change. Good. That's number one, sincerity. Number two. Okay. Not yet. Sorry. To stop the sin that you're committing. A person can't ask Allah for forgiveness. And he's still committing that sin. Yes, ask Allah for forgiveness, 100%. And continue to ask Allah for forgiveness. But is it true repentance? What's your repentance yet? We're not saying that if you commit sin, we're not saying that ask Allah for forgiveness. You continue to ask. Whether you're committing or you're not committing. But again, you want to do it properly? You want to give yourself the best possible chance of forgiveness? Then you have to stop the sin that you're committing. Then say, Rabbi Samahni, Rabbi Kfurli. Rabbi Qinni min Adab al nar But then you go, and you're committing the exact same sin that you continually commit. Ask Allah for forgiveness, but you want to do it properly? You need to stop the sin that you're committing. Or at least try your best to stop the sin. Even if you end up falling into it again. At least try to stop the sin that you're committing. But when a person continues to commit the sin, continues to commit the sin, what repentance are you trying to repent from? What sin are you trying to repent from? What forgiveness are you asking? When you come play games with Allah Azza wa Jal, we want to repent from the sin, we need to stop the sin that we're committing. Third, do a good deed to replace it. Allah, this is a way to get to give us. Regret. To regret the, the sin that you committed. To regret the sin that you committed. Don't commit a sin and continue to show off of your sin. Don't continue to sin and be proud of the sin. Don't continue to sin that you don't show, expose the sin that you've done in secret. Expose it to people. You regret the sin that you've you done, you know, that's you hoping to Allah Azza wa Jalla doesn't get exposed. That's you hoping to Allah Azza wa Jalla that you never repeat it. That's you hoping to Allah Azza wa Jalla that you never fall into that sin again. That's you hoping to Allah Azza wa Jalla that He actually forgives what you done because it was bad, it was wrong. And you understand it was bad and it was wrong. That's you understand if I was to die on that sin, I could very well end up in the hellfire. 
But a person to commit a sin and not care they committed the sin. Again, one of the things that is wrong in Yeni, it's become cliche, but it's wrong, is when people say, I don't regret anything that I did. Don't say that. It's made me who I am today. It is correct. All of your experiences, all of your experiences of the past, now made you the person that you are. But don't say it with that arrogance. No, I don't regret anything that I've done. No, I regret the bad that I've done. Even though I learned from it, yes. I learned from that experience, yes. I can help others, inshallah, yes. But don't say it boastfully. Don't accept what you've done. I, it is what it is. I've done it, I've done it. No. What happened, happened, but I regret what I've done. And if I had a chance, again, I wish I wouldn't have done it. And I won't expose what I've done unless there's a need. Some people talk about the sins that they used to do. You would have never known about their sin, but they'll expose it, no problem. Try and hide your sins as much as possible. The fourth intention. Is that because they're right? No. It's, it's linked to what we, it's very similar to what we said, but it's got a different meaning. Intention? We said intention, we said regret, we said intention, stop the sin, and to regret. No good the intention not to do it again. The intention never to do it again. The intention never to do it again. Where, is, where does that differ from others? You need to have the intention that I'm never going to go to that sin again. When people regret what they've done, for example, he went out on Friday night, he done everything that he done, and he regretted it. Like, well, that was bad, man. But he's already got intention that next Friday he's doing the same thing. <coughs> he needs to say, no, I regret what I've done. And part of that regret, which is a condition itself, is that I intend never to go back to that sin. I intend never to go back to that sin. Tayyip, if a person repents and he has these four conditions, he's sincere, he stops, he regrets, he intends never to go back, but he fell into the sin again, don't stop, repent again. Now, but make sure you have all of these four conditions there. And the fifth condition of repentance, because some people are kept off. The fifth condition of repentance, someone said, Ravi, La. Doing a good deed, this is a way to get forgiven. Like al istighfar, this is a way to get forgiven. Doing a good deed is a way to get forgiven, but it's not a condition of tawbah itself. Give the people their rights. The fifth condition is if your sin has to do with someone else, that you give them their rights back. If a sin has to do with the rights of someone, like you owe someone money, you can't just ask Allah for forgiveness. You have to give the people their rights back. Now, and this is something that, yani, again, many people unfortunately they don't do. Some people they ask Allah for forgiveness, but they don't repent by giving the people their rights back if they've taken any right of someone. And the rights of people is according to Sharia, not according to Western law, Australian law, anything else. Example, if you claim bankruptcy on a, on a company, you have people with $300,000, $400, a million dollars, and you claim bankruptcy. Under Australian law, you don't owe these people any money anymore. Okay? But you do, but ways around it, you're not going to pay them, and they can't ask for you in court. Jayid? Unless they can prove it, blah, 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 blah. With Allah Azza wa Jal, is their right ever gone? Their right is never gone. So if you claim bankruptcy and you are lying, yeah, okay, you got away with an Australian court, under Islam, you don't get away from it. You have to give their people their rights back. If in Australian law, you, you know, shut your business down, you open that in your wife's name. You don't owe the credit, you don't owe the people anything. But when it comes to the Sharia, your money is your money, whether it's in your name, your wife's name, your cousin's name, the neighbor's name, I don't know who it is. It's in your, it's your money, you owe the people their right back. Under Australian law, for example, you don't need to sell things which you possess, like your house. Your house maybe is worth $5 million, you don't need to sell it, it's your house, you live in it. Under Islamic law, you need to sell that which is excess. So if you own a $5 million house and you can live in a, a $1 million house, that's acceptable, then you need to sell your $5 million house, give to the, buy the $1 million house to live in, and the $4 million you pay back to people that you owe money to. So there's, again, a lot of rules. There's a lot of rules when it comes to you know, properly abiding by Islam. And the problem with Muslims is not Islam, it is with them not learning their religion and then after that not implementing their religion. Inshallah Azza wa Jal, we will stop here. We will either continue uh, next week, but most likely that will be Ramadan. So there's a chance we may finish off just Ibadul Rahman next Monday after Aisha, Inshallah.
a chance. Not guaranteed. We'll send our message and we'll let everyone know. Inshallah.